How many Cybertrucks do you think Tesla will be able to produce in 2024? Well, if you judge it based on previous comments by Elon, then you might be like Adam Jonas of Morgan Stanley, who's only expecting 30,000 in 2024 and 78,000 in 2025. But if you actually take a closer look at the automation and production line, you might believe that Tesla is able to scale much faster than most are expecting. Today, we're going to review a number of videos taken by the lucky people who were able to get a tour of the Giga Texas Cybertruck production line. Get ready to be blown away. We've got Jeff Lutz joining us. Uh, as you, many of you know, he's an ex-supply chain C-level executive, many of the Fortune 100 companies. And so this is exactly the kind of topic that I needed him to come in and tell us because he was physically there at Giga Texas. He saw the production line and he actually even had some tweets about the automation. Welcome, Jeff. Yeah, great to be with you. I'm super excited, Herbert. This is a great topic for you specifically. So let's get right to your tweets and a lot of the videos you were taking and others were. So you said, after walking one of the Tesla Cybertruck production lines, I can safely tell you, one, mostly robots. Almost no people on the line didn't see all operations, but most. They are not hand-built. <laughs> Some who have not seen the line claim. Tesla seems to have taken another step forward. And then you've got this video. I'll play this, but we've got a number of others as well. This is the Ford front motor install and the outer body panel attachment, both sides concurrently. Robots moving in symphony. What a beautiful thing. We're doing the motor install. Into a cyber truck. There's a rear motor going into a cyber truck. Or front motor, sorry. Front motor install into a cyber truck. So Jeff, you've run factories yourself and you've seen many of this, but is this unusual to see that many bots? I mean, this look like normal bots that are out there. Yeah, no, there's, there's definitely, uh, let me set the stage for people. Um, first off, there's definitely a lot of, uh, Tesla's definitely highly automated in, in their approach to manufacturing. But let me set the stage because there's just a lot of information out there. A lot of it's not, um, not correct. You just things you hear from analysts and so forth. They're hand building these things. They're not. Uh, and then that's one of the reasons I, I shared a couple of videos on the automation. The other thing people need to be clear about is this was an event. You know, there were, you know, hundreds of people in total at this event. And the, the, the rate of cyber truck production at this point um, is, is, you know, it's, it's on its way. It's going up a ramp. But there isn't enough. Uh, continuous, like the Model Y line, there's just so much continuous material flowing through the line that you could just sit there and watch the line all day. In the case of the Cybertruck, I, I believe they're, the, the, you know, every all the machines are kind of running at lower velocity, lower speeds, and they don't have all the lines fully filled up yet. Again, I'm not being critical. I'm just, I'm trying to let people understand like these these machines, each station that we were looking at, were mostly running in demo mode. Like that that front engine install and the, that panel attached, that car wasn't moving on to the next station. What they were doing is they were cycling that station to show us that operation, which is totally fine. This is what you do um, when you have events like this uh, and you've got an early product that's getting up into, into production. So I just wanted to clarify for people, like these stations are running mostly in demo mode. Were, were there you know, 40, 50, 60 or more cyber trucks probably you know throughout the factory at various stages yes will those be completed and moved out to customers yes uh but in terms of the stations that we were watching they were they were running in a circular loop mode there'll, there'll be another one we'll see in a minute and I'll, and I'll show you the exact spot where you know it that that's what it's actually doing and why it's doing it but in terms of tesla uh yeah i, I view this as a high level of automation uh you know there's 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 robots involved at you know every oem but I think the amount of automation that Tesla does is is kind of a step above and beyond. And and more importantly, it's it's what Tesla removes from the product that's not there that's gonna be at in, in some of the other competitive products, I think is is the real 
key is that if, if you don't have to automate or if you don't need the process, that's actually the best thing. But the reason I wanted to share that first clip we looked at is these things are not being hand built. Um, they got their automation up and what they do is they'll run that automation at low speed, get the quality dialed in and then, you know, progressively increase the speed of that automation. And, and that's where you'll see the factory really uh, cranking out product. So I was very impressed with what I saw. You know, before we see other videos of the production line and the automation, there's a question I was going to ask you later, but I need to ask you now because it's like you're the person I want to know, which is somebody said that they were talking to, uh, you know, the employees there. And one of the things they said was that the production for the Cybertruck is actually pretty fast and it's moving quite well. In fact, I, we might have heard Sandy Monroe say 60 cars. I can't remember. Yeah. 60 so, jobs. Yeah. 60 yeah. jobs. So, yeah. But no, the question for you, though, is um, that, but what they said was the employee said that it's not the line is moving really fast. The problem is supply chain. There are certain parts that they can't get enough, and that's what slows them down. Did you hear that? Yeah. And that's not uncommon at this stage of, of ramp where you have all these new things. You have the new exoskeleton, the new, the, the, the new air bending process they talked about. That's a new, unique, or different. We've talked about this concept before on your show. Um, you've got the 48 volt architecture. That's a new. That's a new supply base. New silicon. They're ramping up. Um, I mean, there's a list of things we can go through. Obviously, you've got um, the cyber cells ramping. You have a number of different um, uh, things that are just new in the product. And what you'll so what will happen during the course of a ramp is if they're not stable. Um, normally what you'd like to do is you'd like to ramp your supply chain, your inbound supply chain to your factory well ahead of obviously the factory needing the ramp. You don't want, you know, to be needing the part that day and you're still building at that supplier. So what you'd like to do is time phase the two, um, where you've got the supply base, you know, out, out pretty far ahead of what the factory needs. But when they run into issues and they run in the bottlenecks and they slow down, your factory will run as, as fast as the as the shortest part uh, in, in you know in the material in the material lineup. We call it a material good to or a, the other term is called clear to build. Clear to build means is am I clear to if I wanted to build a thousand trucks, do I have a thousand sets mm. of it start material? Sorry, if I wanted to output a thousand trucks and yeah, do I need to start twelve hundred? Do I have twelve hundred sets of material for my supplier? So that's probably true and that's again that's why these stations are running in more of a circular demo mode is what we saw as as bystanders walking by but there is there was real product flowing through that line um there were really there's 22 trucks um that were delivered it wasn't 10 and, and my guess is there's you know there's many more that were made in the last four to five days that are that are being produced but yeah, in terms of inbound supply chain, I can see there's probably some air pockets that they've got to work through. And then once those stabilize, you know, um, you know, they'll be in good shape. And, and that's what that's what ramping a supply chain is about. It's about, you know, if they want to, you know, let's say they're getting the 250 K, you know, is their annualized run rate where they basically got to run, um, you know, 5 K a week. Right. That's the that's the rough um, run rate. So it'll be basically this stair step uh, up, up, you know, up that run rate. And you definitely would run your supply base ahead of, of your factory. So yeah, there's probably some issues with inbound components. Love it. Clear to build. <laughs> First time I heard that term. Yeah, uh, it's fantastic. So, so you do confirm that's very likely that they have some supply chain that's slowing them down. I did believe that we got confirmation that the Cybertruck is going to start delivery next week. That it's not we're not waiting till January. This is this is moving forward. I believe that that's true. I'm going to show some yeah. four amazing videos. Um, let's go ahead and do that. So this yeah, and is just one uh, comment, Herbert. I didn't. I, I don't. Yeah. So I don't have any inside info or confirmation of an inbound supply chain issue. I don't have any info from that event. Uh, I'm just surmising what it yeah. could possibly be. Yeah, this is it's pretty normal and typical to start up a ramp that way. But I don't have any info from yeah. the event like that. All right, let's uh, so watch this. This is uh, Dirty Tesla had windshield installation, and then we're gonna do three quick videos here. Blue should be pure. 
windshield installation. Love it. Yes, yeah, so you notice what happened there is it it went through the operation of picking of picking the glass. So these these things would be in spa on spacers and stacked. And then what what was probably not shown there is there would be an operation to dispense adhesive um, right. on the perimeter of that glass. And then there would be operations to actually inspect that adhesive to make sure that number one, its X Y coordinates are are on the proper um, track that it needs to be on. Uh, number two, that there's no, um, what happens in a dispense operation, the worst thing that could happen is that you have um, a gap where there's no glue and that, that that would be a huge problem. That's where you would get dust intrusion. That's where you get a lack of adhesion. So there'd be an inspection camera that would go and inspect that adhesive around that perimeter. It would be looking for X, Y, and it would also be looking for height, most likely. So it would be looking at the Z height as well. Once all those checked out, then, then that operation would spin it, and then it would it would adhere it to um, you know to the frame, and then there would be a kind of a almost like a, a a dwell time or a press and hold time, and I'm I'm assuming there's some sort of either clamping operation or there's some sort of mechanical retention to keep that windshield you know exactly where it needs to be as it as it moves through the next process. But these are all the things that Tesla's manufacturing. Remember, these are not there's part of the design engineers, but it's partly the manufacturing engineers that are controlling the automation. And they're also the manufacturing engineers that are controlling the gluing process to make sure like all the parameters, everything's under control, including the temperature of that adhesive. Um, um, again, the volume of the adhesive, the XYZ coordinates uh, of the adhesive, all those things would have to be controlled. So what we saw there was basically a demo again, without the adhesive of picking the glass up, putting it and pressing it down. And that's the biggest piece, of, I think that's the biggest piece of glass used in the automotive industry. Wow, yeah. I guess as we watch more of these automation videos, we just I just keep thinking to myself, at, at some point they're gonna scale this, they're gonna move faster, they're gonna be able to cut you know, uh, time off. I don't see why we wouldn't be able to get higher volumes over time. So let's watch uh, this next one, which is, uh, Tesla owner Silicon Valley, he showed this production line. That part of the glass. Uh, you guys came down the line, you guys got to see the car come down the uh, line, you got to see the power gate, you guys have seen the urethane, we're making a couple more connections to power the car to make it talk, and then you guys are going to make your way where the car actually starts looking like a truck. That's right. That's glue dispense right there. Mm. The Probably without real glue coming out, but that's that's that that machine right there was most likely laying the adhesive down uh, for, for, uh, for those windows to be attached. This next one is from Carwow, and he shows tires being put in. I think in the video they say that it's actually very slow, but I think you explained it at the beginning, which is this is more of a demo, possibly. We'll see. Take a look at it. Mm -hmm. How on earth would you have a man to put a wheel on a car when you can have a very expensive robot to do it instead? Much slower. Hey. <laughs> what? Why, why, what? Why on earth would you have a man do the job if you can get an expensive robot? <laughs> I don't understand. Yeah, and that, that robot, what he doesn't understand is that could be the same robot from Model 3, from Model Y. Um, and, and, and so what Tesla will do is they'll buy that robot. They'll depreciate it over multiple product types and then multiple years. And so the yeah. value of that robot to Tesla in 2024 is a fraction of its original if they could have they could have bought that robot in 2019 uh, for all they know and in terms of speed again all of these stations will start at a, at a certain rate and then they all have a something called the station efficiency goal that they need to meet tesla uses these terms too and they have an efficiency goal they need to meet of of process time and yield that's you know basically when you're when you're looking at efficiency so so what they'll do is they'll they'll increase the speed as fast as possible um, it, with also balancing, you know, the defect side of it. So they're not creating defects, not creating mispicks, um, you know, not creating uh, a cosmetic type damage. Those, those are all the things that they need to think about when they're programming these robots. But yeah, in terms of, you know, expensive, by the way, those, those wheels with the tires on have got the way, I mean, I don't know, they're, 
It would be very exactly. heavy for a human to be carrying them all day. You, that wouldn't be an operation a human would be picking up and throwing under the car all day. That would, it would it would kill you know destroy someone. So yeah, it's yeah. Pro- totally appropriate for a robot to do that. Absolutely, yeah. Station efficiency goal. Thank you for another term. <laughs> I am writing every mm. one of them down, Jeff. One day I'm going to mm-hmm. spit them all out. I'm going to get you a job smart. in uh, uh, with uh, <laughs> in the factory. I could be a consultant, charge them a lot of money, and all I have to do is spit out the terms. <laughs> yeah. You're hired. Well, Tesla knows yeah. this. So Tesla knows all this stuff. So uh, <laughs> they don't need that. I think they need, right now, they need, um, they need to stabilize the inbound supply and just get the line ramped up. They know what they're doing. I need to hire you, Jeff. Okay, so let's go through yeah. the uh, the car panels here. This next video. Exoskeleton assembly. You can see the body panels. They pick them up. Then they plop them on the car and screw them on. Wow. So I'm pretty impressed that uh, apparently you were there uh, in the factory tour. Then many people are coming out going, you know, they actually let you take photos. They let you take video. They let you yeah. watch everything. They, you didn't, you ask for permission and uh, I did. they gave you permission. Yeah, I contacted Tesla. Was, I, I mean, in my experience uh, of all the decades of manufacturing, we were on what's called a window uh, tour, um, which is what you mm-hmm. do with the the public um which is you don't they did not let us walk you know into and around the machines they let us walk in an aisles that were taped off that's usually called the window tour because in like silicon fab operations it would just be a window open and you'd be walking down a hallway um but i did ask tesla because it's not it's not common for you to be uh number one to be allowed to take photos or videos just to have them for yourselves and then definitely it's not common for you to be able to share them. So um, they gave permission on site to be able to capture videos and pictures. But I followed up with them after him saying, hey, is it okay if, if these are shared? And he goes, yeah, share whatever you want. So this, this, this kind of goes back to Tesla. I think their approach you know, to patents, their approach to um, just being very open and transparent. By the way, there was nothing there that we were filming that I would call quote unquote rocket science of like, oh my God, they're automating the, you know, the windshield glass assembly. Like how do they do? I don't, there's nothing there in my experience. Um, what, what would be, there, there's other things that would be of more important know-how that I, I, quite frankly, we didn't see everything to be honest. Everybody thinks they saw the whole car being made. We, we did not see every station, every operation. For sure. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, Wind, what's it, demo something, demo, <laughs> window demo or something. Okay, so uh, I've got some extra photos here, but uh, they show, this is the most hey, beautiful. Hey, Herbert, I'm sorry. I'm, one, I'm sorry, Herbert, one thing I forgot. In all the three videos you showed, there was one theme that ran through all of those videos, which were, and then the one important point I wanted to bring home, there's no people in the in those operations. Now, are there manufacturing engineers programming those robots? Are there technicians maintaining those robots? Is there somebody that probably is a production supervisor that's moving, you know, watching, making sure? Yes. But in terms of like all the manual manual labor and assembly that you're accustomed to seeing, you didn't see any people in those operations. And I think that's a really important takeaway for the viewers. Yeah, I think I saw a... uh a tour of Giga Shanghai and the reporter was talking to a representative of Tesla and he said that there's no people here. All the people are in offices and they're watching video and they're checking to make sure that you said, you just said it earlier, they're like just double checking to make sure that the glue is being put on correctly, but they've got videos of all that and that's what they're doing QA basically. Well, there, so there's, okay, those videos are being captured, but in terms of like making sure the glue is down, and it's got the right volume and, and it's in the right location, that's actual inspection equipment that has been programmed. It's, 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 yeah. auto, it's called AOI, Automatic Optical Inspection, and it's actually programmed this, it, <laughs> it's got machine learning in it. It was basically like, the glue should be here, it should be in this X plane, this Y plane, and it should be this high. And if it's not, we're gonna kick this part out. So they have that uh, in their operations that they'll really drive their quality levels up. Automatic. Optical inspection, AOI. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, Jeff. Big industry. Is... <laughs> yeah. 
the, the, your knowledge is just crazy. I can't believe we're, we're getting this out of this show. Thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah. so these are gorgeous photos of the Cybertruck. You know, they're raised here, Jeff. I mean, is that is that just for show or is it yeah. the way they are? Yeah, that's for show. Um, and and, and uh, the many parts of the manufacturing operation were set lowered in the floor. Many parts of the operation were happening above us. Um, so what Tesla, what, what, what's interesting, I think one key takeaway is Tesla is not only using the X, Y, um, dimensions of the floor, you know, the length and the width right. of the floor, they're really using the height and the volume of the factory to move product around in the most efficient manner. What you're trying to do in a factory is you're trying to reduce the, the distance time and energy involved to move your product from material in to product out. And by, by them using the, the total volume of the factory to move product and not just, you know, X, Y plane on the floor, they're, they're being uh, super efficient at it. That's a good point. They made a point about that. So let's uh, show this photo, which is fantastic. Yeah. You and Alexandra Mertz, Tesla Boomer Mama, you guys were just uh, amazing. And, you met all the top executives there. This is one of them, Tom Jew, who's the main guy. And you said he's ready to head back out to the line, but he yeah. was able to take a photo with you guys. So I've heard that, of course, yeah. everybody, uh, starting from Franz, just being so available, so willing, and and uh, just being kind to the investors. Yeah, all the executives were were out, um, and I we got to meet most of them, and they're so they're very open. Uh, they're very open with engaging with people, with answering questions, um, just really putting themselves um, out in front of people. Again, you know, from you know, from Franz, uh, Drew, uh, Lars, um, it, it, you know, Martin was out. I mean, I, I don't want to name everybody, but I mean, I know Rashawn was out, was out as well, who leads the mechanical uh, supply chain, um, and, and just a number of the execs were out, and then all the engineers that were at each station. They were kind of standing there, arms, you know, hands clutched, ready to answer questions. Very proud of the work that they had done. Uh, and they should be proud of the work that they had done. And, and also kind of thinking about the work that's ahead of them because they've got to get the supply chain, you know, they got to get that factory, you know, fully ramped. Um, but you, you can tell, and we, we Alexander and I, um, we, st we uh, spoke to two of the, the engineers that worked on the air suspension and and, and one of the engineers says, we believe that, you know, this, you know, this has the highest, you know, ground clearance and it has the quickest um, movement from kind of being at its peak height to getting all the way down to the, and that's one of the features of the cyber truck, be able to get in easy and then have the, you know, have the suspension rise very rapidly uh, when you go to drive. And you can tell he was very proud of, of that, but also kind of also not being like overly boastful about it, but just kind of letting us know, like, we think we've done the best thing out there. So the whole, I mean, the Tesla team should be super proud of the work that they've done. And they're, they're you know, because I think to build this product, they've invented, there's new components that were invented in Cybertruck that are physically on the truck that you will buy. And, and, and behind that, there are new processes to make those components that were invented uh, by Tesla to do that. And, um, and that, that's, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Cause if you look at the truck platform, the, you know, the truck, the existing truck platform is out there it's, and it hasn't really changed much in about 75 years. If you were to, you know, tear down a truck from, you know, several decades ago to now, you would find many, many common themes. And Tesla really took that and kind of threw everything out and started from scratch going exoskeleton to the electrical architecture and it's just something to behold so anyway yeah meeting the executives meeting the people that worked on the product um these people did not work out of an existing mold they broke the mold they made something brand new and and now they're taking that something brand new and they're scaling it so you have to keep that in mind keep all that context in mind when we get to having the discussions about what the analysts think later on Okay, Jeff, so one of the things that uh, you, we just saw the automation in the factories, 
Well, how many production um, vehicles do you think Tesla is going to be able to hit for the Cybertruck in 2024? Here's Morgan Stanley's note, and they actually only think 30,000 in 2024 and 78,000 in 2025. <clears throat> Their note says, <clears throat> we forecast 50 deliveries in 2023, followed by 30,000 in 24, 70,000 in 25. The pricing starts at 90,000. <clears> and then supplemented by range of Rivian looking pickups. What? And SUVs in the latter part of the decade. So they actually think that they're going to move away from the Cybertruck design. Gary Black down here, he thinks it's going to be still 100,000 Cybertruck deliveries in 24, 250 in 25. What's your thinking? Yeah, I'm somewhere in the middle. It's the first thing that um, I think these analysts need to do is they need to be clear on when they put a number out. Are they supply constrained or are they demand constrained? And I think it's really important as an analyst for them to put that out. And I don't see them doing that. And they should. Uh, from my perspective, I view it as, as this is a supply constrained story, meaning you have components that are inbound to the factory. And you have, remember all these new supply chains that Tesla's bringing up, the exoskeleton um, work that they've got to do um, to bend to, uh, you know, they've got to work with their, their with their steel suppliers on, on the new formulation. They got to get that in. They've got to do this new bending process at the 48 volt architecture. You got a number of different things, the new air suspension they've done. There's a number of different things that they've done in the product steer by wire can keep, you know, going on and on. Think of those as individual supply chains, whether they're distributed and there's inbound components coming in or Tesla's doing many of those operations in house. There's still an inbound portion, portion from the supply chain, and then there's this operation that Tesla needs to do. So when these analysts talk about numbers, are they supply constrained or demand constrained? I find it hard to believe that the product is going to be, uh, there's going to be a demand issue um, on this product in, in, in for, the, for the first couple of years, to be honest with you. Um, so in terms of the numbers I'm seeing, I, you know, I actually view it as more of a supply constrained story of getting all these different things ramped up. You're only going to be as fast as the slowest part. So I'm, I'm, I'm more of in the, and I want to study this a little bit more, but I, I'm more of in kind of the 70 to 80,000 range. Again, more, more supply constrained than demand uh, uh, constrained at this point and, and for the first year, but then getting the full peak run rate um, by the following um, you know, calendar year. Uh, and I believe Tesla will be running at that. Now, if they solve these, the, this, these things can be very nonlinear. If they solve these inbound supply challenges sooner, if they get if they get through some of the yield issues in their own factory faster, well, then this could be faster. If some of these things are delayed, or guess what? As they do, what I, well, I believe Tesla is doing right now, if I put my chief quality officer hat on, is I believe Tesla is doing a controlled rollout of the Cybertruck. So get dozens to hundreds of them out there and almost kind of manage them like a fleet operation. And when I say by fleet operation, there's some level of monitoring, there's some connection with those customers. You know, I, I'm assuming these first customers signed an NDA, they have a direct communication path back to Tesla engineering. These are things I'm assuming, I don't know it for, for certain, but you know, there's, there's rumors and there's things out there. And, and it's also how we, w I've, seen things managed and I've managed myself in the past when you've got something brand new and kind of avant-garde you you're putting out in the marketplace you want to have a closer connection to your customers so I believe and this this all feeds into what you think the number is going to be so if they're doing a controlled rollout from a quality perspective they may have some inbound component issues they've got to work through especially on the new the new supply chains that they're ramping and they've got some new challenges inside of their factory they got to work through. So I believe they'll be supply constrained uh, for throughout the first year. I believe they're doing this controlled rollout. They're going to manage this very effectively. They're going to have it. When you do a controlled rollout, the reason you do that is, is you want the shortest cycle time from an issue being identified to the issue being resolved and, and uh, cut over into the line. That's the definition of customer has a problem. You know, let's, let's say, um, Let's let's say Alexandra has her cyber truck delivered to her, you know, in, in a week or two. And and Alexandra is very good at documenting things. And she and she's, you know, she finds an issue. Maybe, maybe she walks by the cyber truck, for example, and they didn't coin one of the edges properly on the stainless steel. 
and, and, it, and it rips her sweater. Well, that would be something that should not happen. Uh, and then she would give that feedback. So I walked by the car. Here's the area. I can see where the thread's hanging out. Take a picture of that. Send it over in the Tesla engineering. Then the, the, that information would go right to engineering. It would go right to the manufacturing op- engineering as well. And they would go and they would probably go improve that coining operation on the line. Coining is what you do to give uh, not only a, um, a physically rounded edge, but you would also do it uh, as well for um, from an ID perspective if you want to get a certain type of finish on, on an edge of a piece of metal. Uh, but anyway, long-winded answer. I think supply can, constrained quality, uh, slower kind of quality rollout because it's a brand new product, brand new everything uh, in the beginning. And then they'll be kind of uncorked, I think, in year two. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. This was amazing. Just a masterclass uh, teaching us everything we need to know or a lot of, you know, explaining what we saw in the factory. Follow Jeff on X at the Jeff Lutz. I mean, this is amazing. And he and I are going to do the next video is going to be on cost of goods and the margins for Cybertruck. What are the areas that Tesla could reduce the the cost and then the pricing as well of why they priced the car? Follow, watch for that. Also, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start posting these slides that I use onto my website at herbertong.com. Check that out and uh, you can take a look at those uh, slides. Thank you, Jeff. See everybody. Right. Bye-bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.